Hey, Nick, it's a pleasure to have you on Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Thanks for having me, Brandon. You wrote a great book. It's called Come Up for Air, How Teams Can Leverage Systems and Tools to Stop Drowning in Work. What led you to, to write a book about drowning at work? It sounds like maybe you've had a little bit of experience with this. Yep. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, you know, I think we've all been there and I, I've been, uh, I've had my fair, fair share of experience drowning in work. Um, you know, the background or the genesis of the book is uh, about, you know, five plus years ago, I was having coffee with my now ex business partner and we're having coffee and he taps me on the shoulder one day and he tells me he's leaving and not in two weeks, not in two days, but in two minutes. And I go white. I'm like, my hands are sweating. I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, we're going to go bankrupt. Because you have to understand at that time, even though we had grown very quickly and we got to like 150 team members on the team, grew to seven figures in the first year that we even started, you know, years before that, we grew way too fast. We had 20% new clients in, 15% new uh old clients out. So we were net growing at 5%, but it was good marketing, masking, some fund- fundamentally broken aspects of the business. And when he left, literally people didn't know who I was because he was the face of the business and I was the behind the scenes doing the systems and stuff like that. So, and business strategy. So at the time he left, out of 150 people, maybe five knew who I was. Um, hmm. mo- maybe two clients knew who I was out of 500. And so Within a three month period, it's utter and sheer chaos. Like team members are leaving. Uh, we had 40% of clients leave. Um, uh, I had bank accounts frozen, rumors getting spread of bankruptcy. I'm cashing out my 401k. My dad's taking a second mortgage on the house to make payroll. And I have to make the decision whether I bankrupt the company or I try to turn it around. And back then we were a freelancer marketplace. So we were doing tasks and projects for people. But I've always been obsessed with time and how do you save time? I feel like, you know, time's our most precious resource. Everyone's only got 24 hours in the day. My background in high frequency trading where I'm developing algorithms and coding computers to trade stocks at microsecond speeds to try to capture fractions of a penny fully automated. You know, there you learn microseconds can mean millions. And so I've always been, whether it's high frequency trading or building out this marketplace to uh, kind of let people offload work or now what we do, which, you know, for the better part of a decade, it's been focused on training and consulting on best practices for operational efficiency. And that's the core of my book. I've always been obsessed with time. How do you save time? I want to be known for being able to have saved millions of hours of people's time uh, when I'm gone. And so... Yeah, we went through hard times. I was literally like working 16, 18 hours a day. And it forced me though, the the silver lining is it forced me to really reevaluate where we were struggling, why we got to that place. We fell into the trap most people fall into, which is when you're out of capacity, and this was prior to him leaving, we we grew way too fast in terms of team size. We started hiring all these part-time contractors and then they, they get full, but it might be full like you know, 10, 20 hours a week. So now we've got to go and hire another person. And before you know it, we've got all these people and complexity scales exponentially with team size. And I really felt the full force of that effect. And I talk about complexity scaling exponentially with team size. And the mistake people make, there's three ways to to increase your capacity. One is hiring, which is our solution and a lot of our clients' first knee-jerk reaction. It's usually the worst way the most expensive, it's expensive way. Yeah, you have to you have to pay for recruiting, onboarding, training. Then you pay a salary. Then the odds that they're around in a year isn't super high, and you lose a lot of kind of the the investment of knowledge that you've invested. And if it all works out just perfectly, you've still created exponential complexity to the organization. Way number two is you tell people to work harder. You know, they say they have a full plate. Well, just increase the size of your plate, right? Well, as it turns out, employees don't love that one. And uh, <laughs> that causes burnout and resentment. And then the third way is you get more efficient. You think you, you analyze where people just wasting time going on the scavenger hunt, looking for information that's 
just disorganized. How can you just clean that up? All the stuff that's just adding no value whatsoever and then free up their time to do higher level work. And that creates a better culture. People are happier because people don't like just wasting time, you know, chasing people or searching through 10 different communication tools to find stuff. And it decreases the need to have people burn out or hire people. So yeah, I have been there before. I have nearly drowned in work uh, on the verge of bankruptcy. And that that really uh, sparked the core framework that I talk about in my book, which is the, the CPR framework, communicate, plan, and resource. You illustrated uh, Metcalf's law in your book, which I always appreciate. Uh, and it just kind of illustrates the point that like you add more people to the team, it, it gets exponentially yep. more difficult. I think it's communication. Like maybe just unpack that a little bit and and then how it related to where your organization was at the time and, and then well, how it led into yeah, this framework. So, so back to what I was saying before, complexity scales exponentially with with team size. And so Metcalf's law, it was, it's really no more around networking. So what's the value of a yeah. network, like a cell phone network, for example? Well, you know, at, at an extreme, say that you only have one cell phone in the world. You know, there's no ways to connect with anyone. It's worth zero. You know, so add, as you start adding cell phones to the network, there's exponentially more ways that people can communicate with each other. And the math formula is n times n minus one over two. So if you just plug in a few numbers, a five person team, you have five times four divided by two ways that information can transfer. That's 10 ways information can transfer when it's a five person team. If it's a 10 person team, now you've got 10 times nine over two, that's 45. So doubling the team just from five to 10 goes from 10 ways to connect to 45 ways to connect. So doubling the team four and a half X, the number of nodes and, and ways things can happen. And so when, if you're listening right now and you're at a bandwidth, you're drowning in work and you're like, oh, we really need to hire someone. And then you hire that person. And then you, you, you really don't feel the benefit that you were hoping you would feel from taking a load Actually, off of you. Complexity. It's adding complexity. You got to manage this person. Like it's not that, you add an, another body to the mix and you just get 40 hours off your plate. Like there's a lot of slippage involved and people don't realize the, how extreme that can be. And so that's why I'm so passionate and focused around operational efficiency, because I think that really is the best solution. At some point you do need to hire people, but I think people are hiring too quickly and yeah. it, it's inevitable. You'll need to hire people, but adding them to an efficient system is going to really ensure that you get the most out of people. Usually when you hire people and you're broken on an operational efficiency foundation, you're lucky if you're getting 50% out of what you could be getting out of someone. What comes to mind when somebody says I'm drowning at work? I hear that I hear that phrase all the time. But now that you've done this work yourself, you've, you've written an entire book based on this, what, what's your reaction? And do you obviously we want to start probably diagnosing what their issues are. Well, I feel for them because I've been there. Mm -hmm. um, I then feel that I was spot on with the title of my book because <laughs> yes, you were, <laughs> I mean, I called it come up for air cause I've heard it also so many times. Um, I, you know, I feel for them, but at least I give, I, I have hope for them that it's not rocket science. And I hope that my book and the framework I lay out in the book is, kind of the gateway and the manual to helping them come up for air, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I am hopeful. I think that when you look at how work has shifted over the years and new ways of working, it's all relatively new. Um, email has been around for forever, but Slack and Asana and Teams and, yep. you know, Coda and all these tools, they're all relatively new and no one's ever been taught when and how to best use them. And so, you know, I hope that this book is that manual that people can, reference so that they understand when and how to think about all these relatively new tools. And it's tool agnostic, as you noticed when you were reading it. It's not saying you need to use this tool. This is the best one. We do mention like right now, these are some best in class, but it's really about the principles and framework, how to use it. So I hope that when people are feeling like that, they can read this and feel that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that there is a solution here. Because I think the thing that causes the most stress is when you're stressed out 
but you don't see a path out. Mm-hmm. I pulled a quote from the intro part of your book and it says, I always said that the future of work would be remote. The 2020 pandemic for all its downsides did have one upside. We were transported practically overnight into the future of work. The pandemic accelerated this by a number of years and quote, tell me like, what do you, what do you think was a pandemic I mean, for all it's bad? You, you mentioned downsides, but there's a lot of new tools out. We are forced to, to learn some of these things. So did we build efficiencies and just having to learn some of these, these things throughout the last couple of years? I think that, you know, it just, it's forcing people to be more open-minded to new ways of working. I think, um, I think that a lot of people were forced to start experimenting with things and maybe they got frustrated or some people just loved it. And they're like, Oh my God, I can downsize my office and I can hire people in other States or countries and we can get even more work done. I think that some other people, but I think that, I think that everyone's aligned that for the most part, nine to five in a physical office, Monday through Friday is not that going to be the the norm going forward, whether you're hybrid, whether you're fully remote, but it's it, that's not going to be the case. And so I think, I think it helped accelerate that. I think it, it educated people that there's all these new tools. I think that depending on how they were rolled out, some people might love the tools. Some might think that the tools suck. And my hope with my book is, you know, regardless if you had a bad or good experience, it just shows you a better way of thinking about and using these tools to get right. the most value out of them. You highlight nine principles for efficiency. Uh, people can download it. I think there's a link uh, within the book that you can download the nine principles. But what are a couple of your favorite ones from from an efficiency standpoint? Um, I guess there's like two that stick out the most. And the underlying principle of my book and that I see most people make the mistake of is when you're drowning in work, you optimize to transfer information as fast as possible. Right. And it's, it's, it's normal, right? Like you're really busy. You're already working 12, 10, 12, 14 hours. You're hungry. You're late for a dinner. What do you do? All right. Well, I'm just going to text Brandon or I'm going to send you a Slack message or an email. And it's just whatever's quickest for you in the moment. Cause like you literally are just trying to play hot potato and get it off your plate. <laughs> the problem is right. when everyone has that mindset and everyone's playing hot potato with, the, with each other, you're just in a massive game of hot potato, right? And you got to solve that because sure, everyone's optimizing for themselves locally, but tomorrow or next week when you or a colleague needs to find something, instead of it being one or two clicks away, it might take you a hundred clicks and 20 minutes to find. So when you shift the mindset and you align your team to optimize for retrieval of information rather than transfer of information, that is the underlying principle with my entire CPR framework. And that's really how you get exponential efficiency gain. And we do it in our personal lives. When you do your laundry, I mean, I've never seen how you do your laundry, but I'm guessing when you take your clothes out of the dryer, you separate your socks in one drawer, your shirts in another drawer, your underwear in another drawer. And you do that not because that's the fastest way to be done with your laundry. The fastest way is you just transfer it from your dryer and you throw it all in one drawer. But you don't do that because that would be a disorganized way of doing it. You spend the time to separate and you organize and put things in the drawer it belongs because tomorrow when you need to put together an outfit, it's much easier and faster to retrieve what you're looking for. And so it's the same thing with work, the workplace. Instead of clothing, it's information. And instead of 10 drawers, it's maybe 100 drawers. But if everyone puts things in the right drawer, it's easier to retrieve. And even though in the moment you're sacrificing a few clicks and a few seconds, on the back end, when everyone does that sacrifice, you get exponential time savings. So that's one principle. Another is your mind is for having ideas, not holding ideas. And so you need these systems so you don't have to be running around holding on to and latching on to memory, memorizing something or remembering, oh, I need to send Brandon the show notes or I need to book this or, you know, having a systems where you, okay, I need to do this or I need to get this off my mind. It falls into this bucket, so I'm going to email it. It falls into this bucket, so I'm going to put it in a sauna. It falls into this bucket, so I'm going to put it in the CRM. 
but having a strategy so you know where to capture stuff so that it doesn't get lost and then you could kind of free up your brain space so you're not having to hold on to a hundred things and just freeing up that brain space allows for less stress and more ability to have creative high impact thoughts. A few other things is, you know, team productivity is necessary, but not sufficient for, I mean, individual productivity is necessary, but not sufficient for teams to be productive. It requires collaboration, coordination. Sometimes an individual has to sacrifice their own productivity for the greater good of the team. And in the book, we talk about the 2004 U.S. Men's Olympic basketball team. That's a very famous team that had Larry Brown, the only coach in history to win an NCAA and a, and a NBA championship. You have LeBron James, Tim Duncan, and you know they, they end up getting blown out by Puerto Rico in game one, and they get the bronze medal. Right, so you have a you have a team of individual superstars, but they were thrown together like one or two months before the Olympics, and they didn't play well together as a team compared to these other teams with maybe less individually talented people, but they had been practicing together for years. And so it's not just enough to have smart, high performing people. You need to be coordinated, and so aligning them on the best practices of how to use all these things is absolutely critical. I don't want to blow all the rest of the principles, but you have the sum of small gains and a bunch of others. You'll have to go and check you out go, the book to get, to get the other go get it. Yeah, for sure. So the foundation of the book is the CPR framework. Explain what that is. So I run a company called Leverage. We talked about it. We do operational mm-hmm. efficiency training and consulting. We've done it with seven-figure financial advisors up to poop sprays to Tony <laughs> Robbins to you know Fortune 10 massive social media platforms I can't name. Every company, no matter size or industry, they needed these three buckets to be efficient. And it was the three buckets that helped turn my company around that we've noticed at this point after thousands of teams, everyone needs this stuff. And so those three buckets, regardless of industry sizes, communication, every team and company, if you're listening to this right now, you communicate with people. You communicate with your team. That's internal communication. You communicate with, you know, your friends and your spouse and your boyfriends and girlfriends. That's personal communication. And you have probably clients and vendors and partners, and that's external communication. So everyone communicates, and there's different tools for each of those buckets of communication. Everyone plans. That's tasks and projects. Work needs to get done. Regardless of what you do, you need to be able to delegate work to people. You need to manage your own work and prioritize. In one or two clicks, you should be able to know, what do I need to do today? What's past due that I asked someone to do? What's the status of this project that I'm involved in? All of these things should be very easy to answer within one or two clicks. And again, it doesn't matter the size or your industry. Those are just basics. And then lastly, every company has resources. That's that's your intellectual property. That's your your SOPs, your processes, your knowledge, right? And so again, regardless of anything, you have knowledge, or it could be your core values. That could be an SOP, your, your vision, um, how you onboard a team member, how you do payroll, like all, the, all your processes. And that all needs to be captured in some digital place where it's easy to find and retrieve so that one, you don't have risk if someone leaves, they're leaving with being the only person that knows something. But then two, instead of wasting people's time answering questions, they have the ability to go and click in a few places and find exactly the standard operating procedure or the process that you've invested the time and energy to build and they can self-serve answer themselves. Let's touch on communication first. So there's synchronous and asynchronous types of communication. What are, give give some examples of that and how we can use either one for effectiveness, efficiency. Well, synchronous is anything live. So like right now we're recording this live. We both had to block out a certain time in our calendar and coordinate to be on right now, right? So there's a little bit extra friction and coordination and cost to doing that. However, we wouldn't be able to do this right now asynchronous. That would take forever and and suck. Um, You know, and, and versus asynchronous is I'm writing or I'm sending an audio or video message that the other person doesn't need to block their calendar necessarily. And then on their own time, ideally 
during low productive time when they're in the back of an Uber or going on a walk can go and read that or listen to that and then get back to me if needed on their own time. And there's been a lot of talk about how great asynchronous is. And it is like, if you're not thinking about it, there's definitely a time and a place to do it. And, you know, I talk about in my book, time isn't linear. So 9 a.m. on a Monday is way more valuable of a time slot in your calendar than, you know, say at the end of the week after your hundredth Zoom call and you're brain dead and you're in the back of an Uber without your laptop, you know, that 9 a.m. slot is way more valuable. So if you can cut down on some synchronous time, you have an hour meeting that you can now do in 30 minutes and you shift 30 minutes out and you have people record a Loom video that you can watch, you know, on your own time when you're doing nothing of high value the 30 minutes you just freed up on a Monday might be the 30 minutes of the most valuable time slot across a heat map of your entire calendar. And so it's not just about saving time, it's optimizing time. And anything that's a report out that doesn't require coordination could be done asynchronous. I took a trip to Bali for a conference and I had a two hour car ride. I recorded videos for every person on my executive team, just brain dumping what's on my mind. I filled up the entire two hours when I got to the hotel and I connected to Wi-Fi, I sent them the video. So I made use of that time. And now on their own time, they could watch those videos to see what I'm thinking about and get back to me. Um, There's also times where asynchronous is terrible. Like, I don't know, someone's underperforming and you need to have a tough conversation about an issue. You know, you don't want to do that over Slack. So there's a time and a place for different things. For me, if also there's something where we're back and forth like 20 times on Slack, I just Mm -hmm. stop and say, we need a live meeting. So whenever you need like live deep brainstorming and collaboration, you want to have it live synchronously. But there's a lot of stuff that could be achieved asynchronous that you need to take advantage of. Can't tell you how many times, I mean, before some of these tools were out where somebody be asking how to do something like, can we hop on a screen share? And so that's a synchronous type of communication. Well now loom and other things like it exists where it's like, let me just record a quick video showing you how to do something. And not only can you watch it on your own time, you can save it if you need to learn it again or need a refresher at some point. So some of these tools, like people just don't know they exist. I mean, is there any other like productivity hacks like that, that you love from a communication standpoint? Well, you know, the, probably the number one thing that we're doing right now for people is we have a 30 day inbox zero program where we teach people how to use email properly. And when you think about that. it, not everyone <laughs> uses Slack, not everyone uses Teams, not everyone uses Asana. Everyone, though, uses either Gmail or Outlook. And it's one of those very few quick wins that, depending on the volume of email, you could save three to five hours a week. So learning how to use email and getting how to getting how to get to inbox zero. And we talk about my RAD system, reply, archive, defer in the book, but getting a grip on email, which is the most broken misused tool that people have been using for decades incorrectly. That's usually a good start. And then tools like loom are really fantastic too, to just do some quick report outs and screen sharing. Let's talk about planning. So one of the things that drowns me at work and I'm sure others could resonate with this is meetings. It's just like your whole day might be packed and filled with meetings. They're expensive because you add more people to the meetings. It that's that adds up. And a lot of them aren't run effectively. So what have you learned as you've been going through this work and figuring out for your own business about how to run better meetings to so that are actually worthwhile to go to? Yeah, meetings is like one of the biggest cost sucks that are that's invisible in a company when you think about the cost of one meeting like if you have th- you know two people on a call or four people whatever it is and you think about what their hourly rate is times the length of time like you're talking millions and millions right. of dollars you know for companies and not all meetings suck or aren't valuable but it's just so easy to oh let's just Let's invite these two extra people. Let's make it an hour when it could be 30 minutes or 45 minutes. So we talk about some strategies in the book, how to um, reduce the cost of meetings. Um, Some of the quick wins you can really do too is pre-work, making sure you have an agenda. 
not only that, but, you know, back to kind of the efficiency principles, your brains for having ideas, not holding them. You need to have systems where people can dump ideas or dump things. If you have an agenda and you have a meeting next week, people can dump these things into an agenda because what you don't want, sure, you want them to get it out of their head. But if it's just nonstop pings and dings and Slack or whatever communication tool you use, because people just are dumping to you all the time, that's not productive either. So giving them an agenda where then it can be prioritized and you're still letting them get it out of their head, but it's not distracting you in the moment, that's a huge win. So pre-work, agendas, documenting decisions, clear action items, um, really being cognizant of what aspects need to be synchronous versus asynchronous, really auditing, you know, do, do all these people need to be on it? I've changed all the default times on my calendar so that they end in a five. So 30 minute meetings, really mm. like 25 minutes, yeah. giving you that extra buffer. So little tricks like that are really helpful. Uh, we, there's scheduling tools like Calendly or HubSpot that people should probably be using um, to make it easier to just give people a link to schedule. When is it appropriate to use a project management or planning management system? Anything that's actionable where you want to capture the state of something and hold someone accountable should go in there. So, you know, if we were going to go camping in the forest together, we would need walkie talkies to communicate, but we would need a map to navigate out of the forest. Right. So tools like Slack and teams and Gmail and Outlook, those are walkie talkies. It's not a map, a tool like Asana or Monday or ClickUp. That's a map. Like you can see exactly what's getting done when by who in one click, you can know what you need to do. What's the status of this. You can hold people accountable and have that transparency communications. Just like, Hey everyone, like our podcast with Brandon just came out today. I don't need to hold anyone accountable. It's just an announcement. What did you use to write this book? And because there's a lot of planning that goes into writing a book. What did you use and how did you use it? We used Asana. So we had diff- various projects. So we have like a book project, a marketing project, and then those wrap up into a book portfolio. So we have a come up for our portfolio and then various projects related to the launch of this book, you know, in there. Let's talk about resources and then I'll, I'll let you go. So it's actually kind of timely. I'm actually implementing a knowledge base for my organization. Oh, which um, one are you implementing? Likely to go with Guru. So I hope that's a, a good selection. I, I'm actually ex- I'm vetting other tools right now as well, but yeah. I like Guru. No, I think uh, Guru is good. We have a partnership with Coda. Um, so you might want to check that out. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. So I'm in the early stages of this. But if I want to make sure that a knowledge base is effectively implemented inside my organization, how, how do I go about that? Is, is there a particular structure, a way to organize this so people can find things easier? Like just any advice? I would, I mean, there's, there's some general best practices, but I would, I would take a look at your org chart and try to, to a certain degree, mirror your org chart and assign people ownership of various parts of the knowledge base. Cause mm-hmm. one per, you want like maybe your operations person to be like the safety net catch all, but you still want people, you know, it, one person can't fill out all knowledge for all departments for your entire knowledge base. Right. So how do you divide and conquer? How do you set permission so that not everyone can change things in different places? One thing that with guru that is nice is you can kind of set timers on things. So after a yeah. certain period of time, you know, something you get reminded that you need to re audit an SOP. Right. But be careful. Not I, I, There's a difference between static knowledge and dynamic knowledge that we talk about in the book. So whether you go guru or Coda or notion or confluence, that's all for static knowledge that answers the question who, what, when, where, why for dynamic knowledge that answers the question, how, like how do you onboard a new team member? How right. do you that's do payroll process? And that's, you know, a lot of people hack that in a knowledge base, but you really want a process management tool for that. And we have a partnership with for, with Process Street uh, for that one. With all of these, um, if you reach out, I think on our website somewhere, we, we have some discount codes with all these tools. So if you don't have these tools and you want to sign up, like I, I think we get, you know, 10% or something off of most of these. But yeah, you want to just make sure that Garbage in, garbage out. So you want to make sure that it's 
accurate and usable. Right. Because if people aren't finding what they're looking for exactly. or it's stale information, you're going to make it hard to convince people to stick right. with the program. Well, and let's back up a little bit too with the why behind a knowledge base. So how is it different from either the communication or the planning? Is it... Because uh, I don't know if there's a lot... I don't, I don't know how many organizations out there actually have a knowledge base in, in place or even understand the value behind it, but just maybe give insight to, as to why somebody would implement something like this. Why implement a knowledge base? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the benefits of a knowledge base is... Uh, one, you save time. You save all the time that you'd otherwise spend answering questions for people because they can self-serve. Yeah. Two, you save time when an error happens that could have been avoided because they knew they could have seen kind of what the official way of doing something is. Um, three, you de-risk the company that if someone leaves, they're not leaving with all this knowledge when they you know exit the door. And four, you get people up to speed much quicker. You can like basically give them this like employee manual that's constantly mm-hmm. getting updated and they can quickly learn the key parts of the business that they need to learn. Nick, this has been a lot of fun. I, I loved your book. It's called Come Up for Air, How Teams Can Leverage Systems and Tools to Stop Drowning in Work. It's out February 7th, I believe. Yep. So by the time this airs, awesome. And one, one other thing you should... Go to comeupforair.com because the book, it's a 320-page book. We have a yeah. lot of material, but there's a lot of bonus material for free on comeupforair.com that didn't make it into the book. Mm. That is super valuable resources that I'd highly recommend you go and check out. Fantastic. Anything else you want to point people to? Well, if you need help with the training um, aspect of these things, if you want additional help beyond that, you can go to getleverage.com, um, my training and consulting company. My guest today has been Nick Sonnenberg. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me.